Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. Before we begin, please be aware, we have a tendency to swear. You have been warned, make no mistake, so join us now. We're We're For for Fox Fox Sake. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm the token Gryffindor host, Ellen, and recording with me is my token Slytherin, Max. As introductions go, I'm pretty happy to be the token Slytherin. (laughs) (laughs) We were supposed to have Abigail recording with us today, too, but her husband went in for an outpatient procedure and needed some unexpected extra recovery time when it was done. So she's taking care of him and will be back for the next recording session. We're really looking forward to having you back, Abigail, and we hope that Andrew feels better soon. But let's fly into the Phoenix flashback. Last week, we covered the second half of chapter 18, Birthday Surprises, and the mostly corresponding film scenes. Aside from leaving out Apparition, Wilkie Twycross's 3Ds, Harry's Malfoy meddling mania, and just how long those love potion spiked chocolates have been hanging out, the movie does an excellent job making a cringy moment funny. Ron gets dosed, which goes against typical tropes, and the ensuing escapades as Harry attempts to get him to Slughorn's office for a remedy create awkward hilarity that Rupert Grint brings to life at a genius level. Slughorn's tonic for nerves solves the problem, leaving Ron feeling awful, but it's nothing alcohol can't fix. Unless, of course, said alcohol is also spiked, this time with poison. Thankfully, Harry had cheated on his antidotes lesson in potions, and a Beezor was right at hand to shove down Ron's throat, saving him from the girls that are going to kill him. These girls, <laughs> they're going to kill me. <laughs> I do love that line. It's ridiculous, but it was funny and well delivered. It just shows how like unaware he was of the entire situation. <laughs> right? During episode 229, Meddling with Malfoy, our Potter pondering was... What D nicknames do you think the students called Wilkie Twycross? G'day, it's Jackson. I'm calling in my pot of pondering. What do I think some of the D words for Wilkie Twycross were? Ooh, I can think of a few. Uh, there's your basics, you know, dickhead, Dumbo. Uh, what else? Uh, dickweed. Pretty much they all start with dick, I would say. Like, dick weed, dick wad, dick head. There's also dipshit, douchebag. Hmm. That's pretty much all I can think of. <laughs> Hi, this is Jessica, and this is my pondering. Dipshit, dongbuster, dimrod, dum dum bean, dimple shit. Donkey butt cross, deliberating dipshit, determined dick face, destination dynamo, door stop, demon baby, duke of dumbassery, ditzy doodle, dingbat, doofus, dilly doodoo, dorkmeister, dingleberry, Thank you for your time. This is Zach Thurston, and this is my Potter pondering on what I think the nicknames were for Wilkie Tricross. I believe they were likely something along these lines. Dipshit, Dragon Dung, Dung for Brains, Dung Lover, or Dr. Git. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, why were Fred and George in Hogsmeade on Ron's birthday? The answer was they were thinking of buying Zonkos to start a Hogsmeade branch. Congratulations goes to... Jessica Wallace! Yay! She's up to seven weeks in a row. Is she going to keep this going? Is someone going to take it from her? You never know. For now, let's dive into the first half of Chapter 19, Elf Tales, and the film scenes that somehow both correspond and don't correspond at the same time. Chapter 19, Elf Tales, Part 1 Later in the evening on Ron's birthday, Harry, Hermione, Ginny, Fred, and George are all visiting him in the hospital wing. 
Fred comments on it not being one of Ron's better birthdays, and George grimly mentions how it isn't how they imagined giving him his present. Fred and George tell them they were in Hogsmeade, since they were thinking of buying Zonkos to have a Hogsmeade branch, but it won't do them any good if the students aren't allowed out on weekends anymore. Fred says never mind that now and asks Harry how it happened. Harry recounts the story for what feels like the hundredth time, saying after he got the bezoar down his throat, his breathing eased up and Slughorn ran for help. McGonagall and Madame Pomfrey turned up and brought him to the hospital wing. They think he'll be all right, but he will have to stay for about a week and keep taking Essence of Rue. George said it was lucky Harry thought of a bezoar, and Harry says it was lucky one was in the room. Hermione gives a little sniff, and it's basically the first sound she's made since running up to Harry outside the hospital wing and asking what happened. She didn't take any part in Harry and Ginny's discussion about how Ron was poisoned, instead just standing clenched-jawed until they were allowed to see him. Fred asks Ginny if their parents know, and Ginny informs him that they do and are with Dumbledore right now but will be back soon. They all begin discussing how he was poisoned, Fred asking if it was in the drink. He wonders if Slughorn could have sipped it into Ron's glass without Harry seeing, and though he figures he could have, Harry doesn't know why he would have wanted to poison Ron. Fred suggests he might have mixed up the glasses, and Ginny wonders why Slughorn would want to poison Harry, wondering if he thinks he might be a Death Eater. Fred figures it's possible, and George suggests he could be under the Imperious Curse. Ginny thinks the poison could have been in the bottle and therefore meant for Slughorn himself. As they wonder who would want to kill Slughorn, Harry reckons Voldemort might want him out of the way. Ginny brings up how he said Slughorn had been planning to give the bottle to Dumbledore for Christmas, meaning he could have been the target. Speaking up for the first time in hours, Hermione points out that anyone who knew Slughorn would have known there was a good chance he'd keep something that tasty for himself. Ron groans Hermione's name and they all stop and stare at him, but he merely starts snoring again. The hospital wing doors fly open and Hagrid strides in, leaving large muddy footprints as he says he's been in the forest all day with Aragog who is getting worse, and he just got back and heard about Ron from Professor Sprout. Madame Pomfrey bustles out of her office, telling them they can't have more than six visitors at a time, and George points out that Hagrid is the sixth. To cover her confusion, she begins to clear up the footprints. Hagrid asks who would want to hurt him, and Harry informs him they were just discussing it and don't know. Hagrid suggests it could be a grudge against the Gryffindor Quidditch team, since it was first Katie and now Ron, but George doesn't think anyone would bump off a Quidditch team. Fred thinks Wood might have done the Slytherins if he could have gotten away with it, but Hermione quietly states that she thinks there's a connection, just not Quidditch. Fred asks her what she does think, and Hermione explains that they both ought to have been fatal, but weren't, by pure luck. Neither seems to have reached the person they were meant to kill, but that also makes the person behind it more dangerous, since they don't seem to care about innocent bystanders. Before anyone can respond, Mr. and Mrs. Weasley re-enter the hospital wing and hurry up the ward. Mrs. Weasley immediately grabs Harry and hugs him for saving Ron with the bezoar, exclaiming how he saved Ginny, Arthur, and now Ron. Harry awkwardly protests this, but Mr. Weasley also speaks up, saying half their family does seem to owe their lives to him and that it was a lucky day for the Weasleys when Ron decided to sit in his compartment on the Hogwarts Express. Harry doesn't know what to say to this and is almost glad when Madame Pomfrey shows up to remind them there can only be six visitors. Hermione, Harry, and Hagrid all head out, leaving Rod with his family. As the three of them walk through the corridor, Hagrid mentions how worried Dumbledore is and Hermione wonders if he has any ideas. Hagrid figures he's got hundreds, but doesn't know who sent the necklace or put the poison in the wine, or they would have been caught. He lowers his voice and says he's worried how long Hogwarts can stay open if kids are being attacked. It's like the Chamber of Secrets all over again. Parents are going to panic and pull their kids, and the governors are going to start talking about shutting them up for good. 
Hermione is worried and doesn't think this will happen, but Hagrid explains that while there's always a risk sending a kid to Hogwarts, attempted murder is different. He begins to say something about Dumbledore being angry with Snape, but cuts himself off looking guilty. Harry presses to know why, and Hagrid tries to dodge the question, but ultimately ends up explaining that he heard them arguing. Snape was telling Dumbledore that he took too much for granted, and maybe he didn't want to do it anymore. Harry wants to know what Snape means, but Hagrid doesn't know, just explains that Dumbledore responded that he already agreed to, and that was all there was to it. Though he also said something about Snape making investigations into Slytherin House, but nothing is odd about that, since all of the heads of houses were asked to investigate the necklace business. Harry points out that Dumbledore isn't having rows with the rest of them, but Hagrid insists that he shouldn't read too much into this. Hermione cuts them off to say look out, just before Filch turns the corner and threatens them with detention for being out of bed so late. Hagrid reminds him they are with him, and Filch obnoxiously wonders what difference that makes. In response, Hagrid fires up, saying he's a ruddy teacher and calling Filch a sneaking squib. He then tells Harry and Hermione to get going, and the two hurry off just as Filch and Hagrid begin yelling at one another. They pass Peeves on the way, who is happily heading towards the yelling, cackling. When there's strife and when there's trouble, call on Peevesy, he'll make double. The fat lady is snoozing and not happy about being woken, but does allow them into the empty common room. Hermione says good night and heads to the girls' dormitory, but Harry stays back and sits by the dying fire, thinking over the information that Dumbledore argued with Snape. He wonders why he lost his temper with him and why he pretended there was nothing to Harry's suspicions, thinking he may have been trying to keep him from doing something foolish or being distracted from their lessons. He's interrupted from his thoughts as Cormac McLaggen rises from a distant chair and tells him he was waiting for him to come back. He saw them take Ron to the hospital wing and figures he won't be fit for their next Quidditch match, assuming that means he will be playing keeper. When Harry has no argument against this and responds that he supposes so, Cormac asks when the next practice is. Harry informs him that it's the next evening and then has to shut down discussions of strategy by saying he's pretty tired. The news of Ron's poisoning spreads pretty quickly the next day, but it does not cause the same sensation that Katie's injury did, since they seem to think it was an accident and he was quickly given an antidote. The Gryffindors are much more interested in the upcoming match against Hufflepuff, as they are looking for retribution against Zacharias Smith for his commentary during their previous match against Slytherin. Harry's interest in Quidditch is at an all-time low, as his obsession with Malfoy is taking over. He checks the Marauder's map every chance he gets, and sometimes makes detours to wherever he happens to be, but has yet to catch him doing anything out of the ordinary. There are also the inexplicable times when Malfoy simply vanishes from the map. He doesn't get a lot of time to consider it with Quidditch practice, homework, and the fact he is being dogged by Cormac and Lavender everywhere he goes, and can't decide who is more annoying. Cormac constantly wants to discuss Quidditch strategies, and keeps hinting that he would make a better permanent keeper than Ron. Lavender has taken to trying to discuss Ron's feelings, making Harry extremely uncomfortable. He asks her why she doesn't just talk to Ron about it, and she says she would, but he's always asleep when she goes to see him. This surprises Harry, who has always found Ron perfectly alert when he visits. Lavender then demands to know if Hermione is still visiting him, and Harry uncomfortably says he thinks so, since they are friends. Lavender points out that they didn't talk for weeks when he started going out with her, but she supposes Hermione wants to be friends with him again now that he's gotten all interesting. Harry doesn't think getting poisoned is being interesting, but sees Cormac and uses him as an excuse to get out of the conversation. He then dashes through a door pretending to be a wall and sprints to potions where neither Cormac nor Lavender can follow him. The movie section picks up in the hospital wing. Madame Pomfrey is checking on an unconscious Ron with Harry standing behind Ginny, who is in a chair beside the nurse, while Hermione sits in another chair on the other side of the bed. 
Harry turns to look behind him at the sound of approaching footsteps, and Professor McGonagall, Dumbledore, Snape, and Slughorn all approach Ron's bed as well. Dumbledore praises Harry's quick thinking to use a bezoar, telling Horace he must be very proud of his student. After a moment's hesitation, Slughorn agrees he is very proud. McGonagall says Potter's actions were very heroic, but she wants to know why they were necessary. Dumbledore seconds this, mentioning to Slughorn that the mead bottle looks like it was a gift. He asks if he remembers who gave him the bottle, sniffing it and commenting on the remarkably subtle hints of licorice and cherry when not polluted by poison. Snape takes the bottle and smells it too. As Slughorn says he had actually intended to give it as a gift himself, Dumbledore asks who the intended recipient was, and Slughorn responds that it was meant to be a gift to him. The professors all look gravely at one another, but before another word can be shared, Lavender runs into the room, desperately wanting to know where her one one is. She pushes through Slughorn and Snape, wondering if he has been asking for her and finds him unconscious in the hospital bed. When she sees Hermione beside his bed, she asks what she is doing there. Hermione stands and demands to know the same thing. Lavender steps forward, reminding Hermione that she happens to be his girlfriend. Hermione retorts that she happens to be his... friend. Lavender reminds her that they haven't spoken in weeks, and says that she supposes she wants to make up with him now that he's all interesting. Hermione points out that he's been poisoned, calling her a daft dimbo, and also states for the record that she's always found him interesting. Ron begins to mutter something, and the girls stop arguing for the moment. Lavender's sure that he senses her presence, and leans over his bed, telling him not to worry, and assuring him that she's there. Ron mumbles something intelligible, then murmurs Hermione's name a couple of times. Lavender begins crying, and runs off as Hermione sits on the bed and takes Ron's hand. Dumbledore watches Lavender flee the hospital wing, sobbing, and makes a comment about being young and feeling love's keen sting. He then tells everyone to leave, saying Mr. Weasley is well tended. The professors all begin leaving, though Slughorn hesitates and watches the scene in concern a moment longer. Ginny stands and comments, about time, to Harry, who agrees with a nod and a smile. Madame Pomfrey swoops in to set something down by Ron, and Harry thanks her as she walks away. Hermione looks up at Harry and gives a slight smile and an embarrassed shut-up. Harry smiles back and turns to leave without saying anything as Hermione sits, holding Ron's hand and smiling. Aww. It's very sweet, isn't it? There's a lot of similarities between what happens in the book chapter and how they did it in the movie. However, there's also kind of a lot of differences, too. There are. There are a lot of differences. I think they leave a ton of content out but they manage to capture the essence of all the feelings they definitely got the essence and some of the changes were very minor and not that important but like you said they did leave out things as carly likes to call it they gave us the lemon water <laughs> not lemonade not the whole lemon just the some lemon, lemon water. water although next episode it's going to be like they just sort of passed the lemon over the glass of water and didn't put any of it in at all <laughs> and that's all one scene as well like nothing else happened and i know it's the same in the book that they don't leave the hospital wing but that is one scene in the hospital wing that takes about two minutes three minutes three give minutes. or take yeah and then what happened in the hospital wing aside from being a little bit different but like you said the essence is there like, it lines up fairly well, but then they leave the hospital wing, and a whole other thing happens that we don't get at all. At least not at yeah. this point. We might get another essence of it later on, but we haven't yet. No, exactly. It's, uh, it's um, I mean, most stuff that includes Hagrid, and especially Filch, in the book gets left out of the film. I don't think Filch really features in the film at all. I don't think he's in this one. I think you're right. Bless him. He's bu he was busy. <laughs> yeah, probably. This is around I think Game this of Thrones, around Game of Thrones sure times too. <laughs> yeah. Murdering people at his household for a wedding. He's busy. That's kind of a big thing. But one of the biggest difference, aside from the fact that they left out Hagrid and Filch, was they also left out Fred and George. Because they too were in the hospital wing. And that's really sweet. I know that they were, like, already there in Hogsmeade, but 
these brothers literally planned to go check out Zonko's thinking of buying it to have a Hogsmeade branch. Which was our trivia question. Right. But they planned it to go look at Zonko's on their brother's birthday and had a gift for him. I imagine the gift was something from Weasley's Wizarding Wheezes. Like, hey, we're going to give you some of the products that you wanted for free earlier this year and we wouldn't do it. But here you go now. (laughs) But still, like, that's really sweet of these boys. And then they're like hanging out waiting and waiting and waiting. And then they find out that the trip was canceled. I don't know if they found out immediately that Ron was also poisoned, or maybe they decided to just go visit the castle to give him the gift that way since they were so close. I mean, you've got to assume that they would have found out about Ron being poisoned because, like, Molly and Arthur are are there already. But I think that that does speak to how odd it is that they leave them out of the film because it's not exactly a, a more than, what, hour's trip? It's not even an hour's trip to get from anywhere in the world to Hogwarts. So... Leaving them out was possibly not the best idea. And I'm bummed that they did, because I always like seeing more of James and Oliver Phelps. They were the perfect Weasley twins. But they are talking about how this isn't how they imagined giving him his gift. They thought he'd at least be conscious for it. And you just, you know, the usual twin shenanigans that they're kind of assholes, but they're really funny, but they're also really sweet. And as Carly loves to point out, they're fucking geniuses. So we'll throw that in there for her. It's fun as well to get a reminder of it being Ron's birthday, which was left out of the film too. (laughs) Oh yeah, completely. And it really was. They're like, so this wasn't one of Ron's better birthdays. Like, this is his big birthday. He's turning 17 or he's turned 17 and he gets dosed with a love potion and then fucking poisoned. <laughs> like, no, this definitely... In fact, I may go out on a limb and call it his worst Wrong birthday. worst birthday. <laughs> I don't know how it gets much worse than that. Like, oh, hey, happy birthday. You're going to almost make a fool out of yourself and then nearly die. And then you're going to spend the rest of the evening plus a whole other like week in the hospital wing. Because that's what Madame Pomfrey says, that he's got to stay there for about a week and keep taking Essence of Rue. And he gets dumped. Well, well. <laughs> I mean, that was self-inflicted. He didn't mean to, to cause the breakup there. <laughs> Not then. And it is different from the book to the movie, how it It happens. We're going to have to talk more about that when we get to that point, but it's pretty fucking funny. Awful, but funny. George is saying that it was really lucky that Harry thought of a Beezor, and Harry's just like, it was lucky there was one in the room. And you know there's that little part of him that's just like, because I used it on my potions project and it was accepted. But... The only response that he gets, it's not the time to say that, but I'm positive it went through his head. The only response he gets from Hermione in this moment is a little sniff, which I feel like was her involuntary reaction to knowing that Harry cheating and getting all of that credit is the only reason why Ron is still alive. And it probably is just this inner turmoil that she just can't even process at this point. Like, if Harry hadn't have done this, my future husband would be dead. Yeah. But when he did this, I was really annoyed. And then on top of that, she is super worried about Ron, which I can completely understand. So just been sitting in silence for hours at this point. And this is basically where the movie comes in. Except, like I said, there's no Fred and George. Other than that, the people that are there start off the same. Yeah, and... We hit the scene quite hard of jumping from Ron recovering in Slughorn's study and then being in the hospital wing. So it's a quite a hard switch for the film to do as well, because we're heading from late at night to the hospital wing. We get no build up to that. We get no involvement of other characters. We've just jumped straight there. And there's no mention of his parents. Which is something that Fred and George ask about. They're like, hey, do mom and dad know? And Ginny says, yeah, they were here before. Now they're with Dumbledore in his office, but they'll be back mm-hmm. soon. And then they slip into a whole conversation about how Ron was poisoned and why. And they speculate that it maybe was meant for Harry and he just 
done by Slughorn, but he accidentally switched the glasses. And Ginny and Harry are like, why would he poison either of us? And and then Fred and George are like, well, maybe he's a Death Eater or maybe he's been a Purist. And then Ginny says, well, you said that Slughorn wanted to give that bottle to Dumbledore as a Christmas present. So maybe Dumbledore was the target. And then Hermione finally speaks up to say something along the lines of then the attempted murderer isn't somebody who seems to know Slughorn very well because anybody who did know him would know that there's a really good chance he's going to keep something that tasty for himself and not actually give it away, which is pretty much exactly what happens. I think maybe he forgot that he had gotten it and just left it sitting on his table, but he certainly didn't be like, oh, I'll give it to him late. Like, did he end up giving Dumbledore a present at all? I mean, we've got to assume no. I mean, he, he, we get to the point of him looking for drinks on his table, and there is more than that there. And he elects to go for the unopened gift for someone else. <laughs> Which we talked about a little bit in the previous episode, where he specifically mentioned in the book that it was meant to be for Dumbledore, but that in the movie it was more of a... I had other intentions for this. And he didn't, like, state it then. And I don't remember who said it. I think it was Abigail. Yeah, Abigail said something about pointing out that it was more of a big reveal in this moment. Because they kind of discuss it. Except it's not the kids discussing it. Because in the movie, we've got McGonagall, Dumbledore, Snape, and Slughorn all coming in to check on Ron. And they discuss it in front of the kids. Which, for streamlining sake i get but i don't believe for a moment that's something they would have done i do not believe that mcgonagall in front of these children would have been like why did harry potter have to be heroic that seems like a private discussion i mean it works better i think in the film to not have all the other characters from the book there while she says that like because it's just Golden Trio, one of whom is unconscious, Ginny, and actually that's it until Lavender Brown comes in. I think it's safer to discuss that sort of thing. And I and maybe that's why there aren't that many people there, because at least everyone there I'm not sure if Ginny knows actually in the film, but at least everyone there is aware of Harry's mission, is aware of how this might have happened. I feel like Ginny and Slughorn know it at the same level where they know because of who they associate with and the the fact that they're intelligent and they can assume, but neither of them have been given direct information. Although, and I say if they had Fred and George in there, or if they had Hagrid in there, that would have been a very crowded room and Madame Pompey would have had been like, only six people allowed. In the book, the teachers never come in. I imagine they had been there earlier. This is supposed to be like hours after they were waiting to get to go see Ron and were finally in there sitting with him. So the teachers have already checked on Ron, made sure he's okay, figure out what he needed, and then all went back to Dumbledore's office to discuss in privately what happened, why it happened, what it means, what they're going to do to make sure something like this doesn't happen again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are no teachers in at all until Hagrid shows up, which, like we said already, the movie doesn't give us. Hagrid comes in, leaving giant muddy footprints. Heaven forbid you wipe your boots at the door, but, you know, whatever. Just, I mean, he had to have tracked those through the entire castle if he was still leaving muddy footprints in the hospital wing by the time he gets there. Like, no wonder Filch doesn't like him. The guy just, like, excretes mud (laughs) wherever he goes. He's just wearing mud boots. They're designed, they have, like, a hollow sole that absorbs the mud so that every time you step on it, it just squirts out a little bit more. And so he doesn't kill any worms when he's walking around. (laughs) Yes, and they're, like, worms in the boots, too. It's just their little habitat. If anybody would do that, it would be Hagrid. But I can't blame Filch for being mad at him if he's tracking mud all over the castle like that. Dude can't clean that with magic. He's just leaving a huge mess for Filch. (laughs) But he comes in, mentions that he'd been in the forest, hence the muddy boots, and that he's been spending time with Aragog, who's getting worse. Got back, 
ran into Professor Sprout who filled him in on what happened to Ron. And I imagine that was just something like, oh, I know you're really close with this student. He's currently in the hospital wing. You might want to go check on him type thing. Yeah. Like I said, Madame Pomfrey comes out and yells at them for having more than six visitors, but she apparently is just counting Hagrid as more than one person because he is the sixth visitor. And she's just like, uh, oh, and then starts cleaning up the footprints. So I guess, hey, at least in the hospital wing, Filch doesn't have to worry about that. I mean, it's a lot to suddenly have in your hospital room, isn't it? A large, muddy man. <laughs> yeah, it would be a little overwhelming. And I'm pretty sure that hospital wings are supposed to be pretty clean. <laughs> and it does not sound like Hagrid is. No. I'm sure he smells great, but I don't know if he's clean. <laughs> I feel like he smells very woodsy. Ooh, woodsy. I don't know that I would want to bottle it as a cologne and spray it all over my husband, but woodsy and rugged. I'm not, I'm not saying that I want all the men in my life to smell like Hagrid. <laughs> <laughs> Ode Agrid. <laughs> Ode Agrid. <laughs> anyway, Woodsy Hagrid joins in their conversation of what could have happened with the poison and why it happened. And his thought is that somebody has a grudge with the Gryffindor Quidditch team, <laughs> which I love. He's like, but first it was Katie, now it's Ron. Maybe someone's going after your Quidditch team. And George is like, I don't think anybody would bump off a Quidditch team. And I love Fred's response because it says that he says fairly. Wood might have done the Slytherins if he could have gotten away with it. And honestly, all of her Wood might have done the Slytherins if he could have gotten away with it. A hundred percent. Think of any opportunity for that to happen. The guy obviously wants them gone and dead and he's quite i don't know what the word would be but he's quite smooth and calculated like a spy so he could definitely do some poisony shit not saying he killed ron but <laughs> yeah yeah part of me wants to be like maybe he wouldn't actually murder them just incapacitate them but I don't even know that I believe myself saying that. I think he might actually try to murder Slytherins before a Quidditch match. He's got to get revenge for that really quite horrible um, uh, bludger he took in Philosopher's Stone. Well, yeah, that's true. At this point, Hermione actually speaks up the logic in the room. She says that she thinks they are connected, but not by Quidditch. Which Fred's like, well, what, what are you thinking? And Hermione points out that both attacks were meant to be fatal and only weren't by pure luck. The tiny little hole in Katie's glove being the only skin that touched it. And Harry being right there on hand to shove a bezoar down Ron's throat. Like, had that not been the case in both situations, they probably both would have died. And... That brings her to the fact that they were not the intended victims. They were bystanders that just either wrong place, wrong time, or were pawns in the scheme. And that kind of makes whoever is behind this even more dangerous because they don't seem to care how many people they accidentally off along the way of trying to off their intended target. And with this claim... Mr. and Mrs. Weasley come back in the hospital wing, so their conversation is kind of cut off. And that's something we don't see in the movie at all. Like I said, Mr. and Mrs. Weasley are not there to be concerned about their poisoned son. Hmm. And that's weird to me. It is. Maybe the movie is trying to be later on than that, rather than just not having done it at all. But he hasn't woken up in the movie. Like I feel like they would still be there. <laughs> yeah, he had like a... It was almost like a brief consciousness just so he could deliver that line about the girls trying to kill him. And then he like passes back out again, mm. which kind of makes me wonder if they were trying to leave it like maybe he was worse than he was to cut immediately to him unconscious in the hospital wing. But if that's where they were going with that and it was earlier than it was supposed to be, I wish they hadn't given him that line funny as it was. Yeah. I think 
they were trying to hold on to the comedy of the moment that had been the there. rom-com the romedy <laughs> but i think it did slightly kill that switch to seriousness to have him just be straight back up i feel like he could have just been straight to the hospital wing yeah and i would have been nice to see the weasleys especially mrs weasley being all mama bear and then the two of them so grateful to harry it's just that relationship building when you realize just how much harry is part of their family and Mm -hmm. how much they love him and appreciate him because mrs weasley is immediately like just grabbing harry and pulling him into the tightest hug because previously they stopped by just long enough to make sure he was going to be okay and then they went to go discuss it in dumbledore's office in private not in the open hospital wing so now that they're back they can actually talk to everybody else and see how everyone else is doing and thank harry because now he's saved Ginny, arthur and ron and harry's just like oh no, no i don't like that's not really uh, uh, in And then Mr. Weasley says, no, it does seem like half our family owes their lives to you. It was a lucky day for the Weasleys when Ron decided to sit in your compartment on the Hogwarts Express. And every time I read that, I'm like, was it? It's a weird one. It's it's such an odd little bit of exposition. (laughs) Because, like, a lot of the bad shit that happens to them happened because of their connection to harry like would riddle have gone after jenny at all if she hadn't been his best friend's sister and somebody that mattered to harry if she hadn't have had that crush on him like exactly like the entire plan centered around her having this huge crush on harry which she might have had regardless but (laughs) but if harry had no idea who she was Would kidnapping her and or having her kidnap herself, essentially, and drag herself down to the Chamber of Secrets where she's essentially switching essences with Diary Riddle made any difference at all if Harry is just like, who? Like, why would he go save her? He doesn't know her. I don't like the closeness between them and the family is what put her in danger. Yeah. Now, Arthur probably still would have been in the order, especially since he was previously. And he, there's a really good chance he would have still been at the ministry on guard duty when the snake attacked him. He probably would have just died. So there is some luck there. (laughs) He may well have died if Harry hadn't had the vision about it. But this situation (laughs) is 100% caused by harry (laughs) oh no absolutely like ron both getting love potioned and poisoned probably would not have happened to ron if he hadn't been best friends with harry because i don't think that ron weasley not being best friends with harry would ever start eating his chocolate cauldrons without permission no (laughs) Granted, in the book, he did think that they were a birthday present that had fallen off the bed. However, the odds of him even having access to those chocolate cauldrons, because if they weren't best friends, Harry probably would not have been looking for the Marauder's Map in front of him. And therefore, they wouldn't have been thrown out of the trunk for Ron to pick up off the ground. Or in the movie version, Ron would not have gone up to the famous Harry Potter's bed and stolen candy off of it. I just don't think he would have. So 100% being best friends with Harry caused the love potioning yeah it's harry's decision to not take ron to the hospital wing, <laughs> but to try and play the situation to his advantage by taking him to see slughorn i f- feel like it wasn't just to try and play slughorn it was also the concern of the love potion it was a two birds one stone being situation. banned and Harry being that dumb Gryffindor that doesn't want to get caught breaking rules. Because he knew that it was spiked with love potion. Hermione told him. She overheard it. He could have taken it straight to the headmaster or someone and been like, so pretty sure there's love potion in here. You might want to crack down on this. But he's a Gryffindor and he's not going to ruin the prank service mail order delivery. He's not going to make it so they can't get their Weasley's Wizard Weezing's Almazon Prime to them. He's going to be a Gryffindor and he's going to keep his mouth shut and he's just going to hide the chocolates in his chest because he's an idiot. How are they not melted? That was the real question. (laughs) 
well, it looks like chocolate cauldrons might actually just kind of be cupcake type things. And the film. I've seen so. multiple versions of them. So I don't know, but whatever they are. Ron would have eaten them anyway. <laughs> I don't think he would have stolen them from the famous Harry Potter if he hadn't been best friends with them, though. No. But also if Ron, if like full stop on that, if if Ron hadn't been friends with him, Harry probably wouldn't have been in Gryffindor. That's true too. It's a whole what if situation. <laughs> oh man. Alternate reality is happening over here. It's like Cursed Child all over mm -hmm. again. But then getting poisoned because Harry takes him to Slughorn and if he had just taken him right to the hospital wing, you're right. It wouldn't have. This is this is Harry's fault. So Lucky, I don't know. I kind of want our keepers to weigh in on this one as well. I just maybe they have some other insights and thoughts or disagree. So, but I think that. That while there are benefits to being best friends with Harry Potter, it's kind of a shit deal sometimes, too. It's a whole shit deal. <laughs> yeah, I think it ends up okay for most of them. Not for Fred. Not for Fred. But he's not, they're not, I guess, he's more the business partner, less friend. <laughs> yeah. Don't get into business with Harry Potter. And that's not really Harry's fault. No, no, no either i think they would have fought anyway the weasleys are just amazing people so but harry is so uncomfortable in this moment that he's actually kind of relieved that madame pomfrey comes back out it's just like six visitors this definitely is not six and he and hermione stand to leave and then hagrid's just like well i'll go too and they just leave all of the weasleys together so they can just be around their sick Juan Juan's bedside, and that is quite different from how the movie portrayed it. Yeah. So in the movie, now we get Lavender run in. Having seemingly just discovered this information. <laughs> well, we're not even sure how much time has passed, so somebody had to tell her. But her desperation and patheticness in this moment was really quite hilarious. The... <sighs> Where is he? Where's my one one? Has he been asking for me? And he's just like passed out in bed. As an acting skill goes, this is fantastic and it's very funny. But also, oh god, it's very hard. It's 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 very hard in on on the whole loving of Ron, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Hermione's had a few years to get this. <laughs> well, Hermione's not. The same kind of frivolous girl that Lavender is. Yeah. Lavender is 100% written as a stereotype, which unfortunately those stereotypes exist because there are girls who do act like that. But I feel like it's also this perpetuating circle because people write girls who act like that into books and movies and then other girls read or see that and then also act like that and then it just creates this vicious cycle of stereotypes women are not typically that desperate and ditzy and dumb and dafty dimboy <laughs> as hermione put it but it is delightful to watch can't believe she, I still can't believe she calls her a dimbo and not a bimbo. I suppose bimbo is quite a nasty thing to say to a 16, maybe 17 year old girl. Yeah, bimbo definitely has a different connotation than dimbo, which I looked up just to make sure. I was like, dimbo? Bimbo? It sounds like dimbo, but I've not personally heard or used that word in my vocabulary. So my brain was always auto-correcting it to bimbo. But when I was really listening to it to write the summary, I was like, I really think she's saying daft dimbo, and I don't know what that means. So I looked it up, and a dimbo is just an idiot. So it makes a lot more sense for her to call Lavender an idiot when she's kind of being an idiot, as opposed to a whore, which I feel like having a desperate love for one boy does not a whore make. It doesn't come across very clearly. <laughs> no. But they have this hilarious exchange where Lavender's like, what's she doing here? And Hermione's like, I might ask you the same thing. I happen to be his girlfriend. Well, I happen to be his friend. 
<laughs> and it's just such a beautiful interaction. The jealousy on both of their yes. parts. And I think it's for obvious reasons. I think that it's really clear Hermione is jealous of Lavender because she is dating the boy that she loves. Yeah. And and then Lavender is clearly jealous of Hermione because, A, I'm positive she knows that Hermione likes Ron and that's why she's so upset and hasn't been talking to him. And B, Hermione is a constant. It can be very tough for insecure girls to deal with their boyfriend having a best female friend. And Lavender is definitely one of those girls. A hundred percent. And also, at this point, even in the books and the movies, having Hermione Granger as someone to contend with, even if it's kind of a false narrative that they've got in their heads, isn't going to be the easiest thing to overcome for a character we've heard of once or twice before. Yeah. This part of the movie section is then completely different from the book. Like you said, it gets the essence, but while these girls are bickering, Ron starts muttering something and they all lean in. And again, with that intensity, Lavender's just like, he senses my presence. Don't worry, Juan Juan, I'm here. And then Ron, who, considering how the book had him pretending to be asleep whenever she'd show up, I'm not 100% positive that he wasn't a little bit conscious for this. Because he just mutters, Hermione, several times. How do I get out of this situation? <laughs> I can't say much. Hermione. And then Lavender immediately starts crying and runs out just sobbing, which prompts one of my least favorite Dumbledore lines. Oh, to be young and feel love's keen sting. Like, dude, you're not Dumbledore. I don't know who the fuck you are, but you are not Dumbledore. And I hate the way the mm. movies wrote him. He always, they always had him saying something really stupid like that. When someone, and several times it's been Ron, are lying injured in a hospital bed. Like, he wouldn't do that. He's really worried. And that's even what the book says next, that Hagrid was saying Dumbledore is really worried. He's not going to make some stupid comment about love's keen sting when there's a chance the school could end up getting shut down because kids keep getting attacked. I wonder if... Stupid <laughs> Ron Con moment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I was, I was going to say... I'm annoyed. I wonder if the characterization of Dumbledore as a slightly more silly sort of headteacher, headmaster, works better in this context because we know better than the book sort of portrays it, that something's coming and like something's going to happen. And I wonder if Dumbledore's personality changes here as a result of him knowing that he's going to die. Or if that could even work better in the narrative if they hadn't done that for the past two films. <laughs> Three films. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't have a problem with Dumbledore's personality being weird and whimsical. We're talking about the man who said odd mint blubber nitwit tweak in his first speech at Harry's first year. Like, I don't have a problem with that. But he does have a really good sense of time and place. And the movie was just like, yeah, we'll have him say something weird here. It's totally normal. It's weird. But no, Hagrid's like, he's worried. The school could get shut down. And Hermione is just like, no, that can't happen. And Hagrid's like, you have to think about it from their perspectives. Like, it's always going to be a little bit dangerous to send a child to a school full of children that are learning how to do magic, some of which is very dangerous. Like, shit can always happen in a situation like that. Like, fuck, even without magic, sending kids to live in a situation like that could mean shit's gonna go down. It probably does, all the time. But there's a very big difference between, oops, accidental magic, hurting somebody, and I poisoned this mead, and a student accidentally drank it, 
instead of the intended target. Like accidental murder or just, you know, somebody with the intention of murdering for reals is a little bit different than that. And if that's happening consistently, I could see why parents would panic and remove their kids. And if enough parents do that, like what else can the governors do but be like, well, no point in doing this. I do think it's less serious than the Chamber of Secrets situation. There, Like, not just in the dramatic irony of we know now that it isn't as serious as the Chamber of Secrets opening, but also it, there were more students affected, no teachers got affected, at least. And also, it was sort of irreparable, the damage that was being done. Like, Ron was poisoned... And then immediately sort of saved. Yeah. And Katie Bell almost killed, sure, but also saved again. Well, I mean, she's still out at St. Mungo's, so not quite saved yet, but at least not, not quite dead. Saved yet. <laughs> at least not dead. There is that, but she's still but not Bell well has enough not told for Katie. to come back. <laughs> no. But yeah, I think the Chamber of Secrets like situation, I understand why Hagrid is panicking about that. Because that's obviously quite traumatic for him in many, well, yeah. many, many ways. For all he knows, they're going to find a way to blame this on him, too. Yeah. Like, we know you like to go to the three broomsticks. Did you pick up that mead to give to Slughorn to give to Dumbledore? Because Hagrid would totally want to poison Dumbledore. Clearly, that's that's Hagrid's MO right there. But I wouldn't blame him for being like, oh, God, they're going to blame this on me, too. Oh, God, no. He runs in, like you say uh aragorn's really sick like he didn't do this <laughs> right <laughs> i never even thought of it that way but no he's totally been like this isn't us this isn't us definitely some trauma there so the way that ron just like sub unconsciously subconsciously i don't know there but the way that he murmurs hermione's name multiple times which still not entirely convinced it wasn't on purpose, b effectively ends his relationship with Lavender without him actually having to do anything. And that is different from the book because Lavender doesn't show up. She doesn't find out till later. She's upset that she wasn't told because she is his girlfriend after all. And she goes to see him several times. Like you mentioned, he's just pretending to be asleep which we do find out just a little bit further down in this section but it's a notable change but it also kind of implies that this is the moment that ron and hermione sort of get together and i guess you can argue that they don't officially because he is unconscious for this so it's like Maybe there's a part of him that dreamed he and Hermione got together, but he doesn't know for sure if it really happened. And so he won't say anything and Hermione's afraid that he was just unconscious and delirious from being poisoned and maybe he didn't really mean it. So they're both like dancing around that for a while. Yeah. But it also just like is a really cute moment. It is, it is a tiny step in terms of like their relationship finding its ultimate sort of end i suppose not ron and lavender but ron and hermione and i like it as a a moment that at least we see hermione being very happy about we see yeah. ron being asleep <laughs> and i love her little like ex look exchange with harry and he just like kind of smiles at her and she just goes shut up <laughs> and it's just so cute because she's like so happy but also like embarrassed she does have this embarrassed sort of guilt at liking Ron. And I think we see that through all the films. Well, Ron has been kind of an asshole to her from time to time, so... Oh, all the time. 100% of the time. Book Ron would still stand up for her if need be. Movie Ron would throw her under the bus. Throw her under the night bus. Ernie would dodge it, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The bus would probably dodge her itself, because I think there's, like, a magic thing with that. I don't know that Ernie really has to do much driving. Ernie just has to sit there. <laughs> right. <laughs> In case anyone looks at it. <laughs> but that's where the movie section wraps up, because there's literally nothing else after it. Like, the whole entire 
next half of this chapter has not a single thing in the movie to correspond to. And on top of that, there's more in this part of the book chapter that the movie just didn't do anything about, which we kind of mentioned before, because now you have Hagrid, Harry, and Hermione, the H's all left, walking through the corridor, just discussing how worried Dumbledore is, like I mentioned. And Hagrid has one of his, I shouldn't have said that, moments where he mentions Dumbledore being really upset with Snape. Which Harry, being the meddler, Harry James meddling Marie Potter, just immediately goes, why is he mad at Snape? And Hagrid's like, I shouldn't have said that. Just put it out of your mind. I'm not going to tell you. And Harry basically yells, no, why is he mad at Snape? And Hagrid tells him to keep his voice down, but he knows he's going to lose this battle. He always loses this battle. I don't even know why he tries to not tell them. In the end, he ends up telling Harry and Hermione all about this argument that he overheard Dumbledore and Snape having when he was leaving the forest. So I assume they were outside. I don't know why they were outside having this argument, but they're outside having this argument about how Dumbledore takes too much for granted and Snape maybe doesn't want to do it anymore. And then Dumbledore saying in response that he's already agreed he would do it, so that's all there is to it. I don't know that he said it in rhyming words, but that's how it came out just now. <laughs> and this was the moment, for me anyway, I don't know how you felt about it. I really wish that Abigail could have been here because as somebody who had watched the movie first, it'd be interesting to see her perspective on it. But this was the moment for me where I was just like, I think Snape and Dumbledore have something set up between them. Yeah, I'm, yeah. And it clicked for me, especially once I found out what happened at the end of this book, that I kept coming back to this moment where he said, maybe I don't want to do it anymore. And I was just like, oh, my God, Dumbledore asked him to kill him. I don't think I got to that conclusion straight away. I mean, I didn't get it in this moment, but this was the moment that made me realize it. So I went into the seventh book, assuming Snape was, in fact, a good guy, even though they ended this one hard leaning him into being a bad guy it was like this was the reveal where oh Dumbledore shouldn't have trusted Snape and I'm like but I think that he should have I love that they give Snape it's not always in the book sometimes it's in the in the movie sometimes it's in the books I love that Snape is always given these moments of oh my god he's the bad guy again through this little like weird interaction he has with with another character which isn't a main character so we have in Philosopher's Stone, like when he has that argument with Professor Pequirrell and it's re it looks really dodgy, but then we get it like later on. Or even in, in Half-Blood Prince, where he interacts with Draco in these odd ways. And obviously in the film, we have that part at the beginning where we see that he is involved in this underhanded plot. But even that isn't, it doesn't give us everything. So again, it's no. this try to throw Snape under the light of suspicion, which he fits so perfectly because everyone kind of wants him to be the bad guy they have done since the beginning. He's an asshole. He has no business being a teacher. Like, this dude is not mentally stable enough to be around children who are also assholes. I love kids. I love teaching. But preteen teenagers are just these bundles of hormones that say whatever they're thinking without any regards to how it might make another person feel. He's a bad teacher. He's a really bad teacher. He's a good information imparter. He's very intelligent. I think he would have been really good at developing curriculums. Just don't let him interact with the kids. He does actually impart knowledge and wisdom in most scenarios. Yeah. That's why I say information imparter. He's not an educator. <laughs> no. But I actually think it is one of the things that ended up making him a good headmaster. Because by then, he genuinely did have his students' best interests at heart and was literally the only person in the wizarding world who could have protected them from the situation they were in without arising any suspicion the way he did it. Like, 
there's a lot of things that man shouldn't be doing, but I can't on the whole hate him the way that a lot of people do. I kind of still feel a lot of pity for him. I really wish he got some therapy. I ultimately feel pity. I also, I do think he does the job he's been given to do. I don't think his main role at Hogwarts has ever been be a teacher. There's always been an underlining motive to what he's doing there. Every single year he is doing something to protect Harry, protect the school, something. I think he's there because Dumbledore trusts him to do that, not to teach, but he can't just keep this guy in his school. Right. That would look really suspicious. It would. <laughs> and it clearly was necessary to keep him there because it made all of the difference in the Wizarding War. But Harry can't see any of this at this point and is just like, what? Dumbledore's arguing with Snape? Tell me more. And Hagrid's just like, I don't know anything beyond what I told you, except for the fact that Dumbledore did say something about Snape investigating the Slytherins. And when Harry starts to get really like, oh, about this, he's just like, but that's not weird because all of the heads of houses were supposed to investigate the necklace business. So don't read into this. And you know Hagrid is just like, don't read into this. He's going to read into this. Harry, don't do it. Harry's like, do it? <laughs> As What was it? Katie always be like, Harry, no. Harry, yes. <laughs> that is one of these moments. But then they're interrupted by the arrival of Filch, who, like I said, I cannot blame him for being annoyed with Hagrid. If he's tracking mud, he's tracking his Ode Agreed all over the castle. And Filch is going to have to clean it up. But he first makes a comment to Harry and Hermione about being out of bed so late. This means detention. And Hagrid's just like, no, it doesn't. They're with me. And Filch, probably because he's mad about the mud, just goes, what does that matter? And Hagrid loses his shit. He's just like, I'm a rutting teacher, you sneaking squib. Because that's the mature adult professor way to handle it. What it does do, though, is get Filch really riled up and it gives Hagrid the opportunity to just sort of mutter out of the corner of his mouth to Harry and Hermione, get out of here now. And he did provide a very good distraction to allow Harry and Hermione to get away and attract Peeves, who, of course, we never ever see in the movies. But Peeves is very drawn to any kind of chaos that is available to watch. I'm sure that he has his poltergeist popcorn and just Michael Jackson's his way through the bucket watching anything. But, God, that was an old meme reference. That really was. That was... <laughs> It's just the thing I always <laughs> picture when somebody's just like eating popcorn, watching shit go down. Watching this train wreck. But Harry and Hermione oh, get man. away, make it back to their common room. Fat lady's sleeping and is kind of annoyed to be woken up, but still lets them in. I feel like she just wouldn't be doing her job if she didn't tell them off a little bit for being out late, even if they were with a teacher. But whatever. They get in the common room. It's empty. Harry's kind of relieved this means that the word about Ron hasn't spread yet because he's really tired of recounting the story at this point. Hermione just goes to bed and Harry decides to stay down because now he has a brain full of things that he needs to sort through to decide what he has to meddle into first. So he sits down in a chair right near the fire, which is starting to go down, and he just stares into it, looking at those burning embers, and thinks, so Dumbledore got in an argument with Snape. Why would he have disregarded the information I gave him? Maybe he just didn't want me to get involved. Harry, you have the brain power to figure that out, and you can't figure it out until you have it staring you in the face? Clearly not in Ravenclaw, but good lord. Good lord. It's this prejudice he has. And I don't think prejudice is the right word. But he can't bring himself to imagine someone else's ambivalence. In Harry's mind, someone is either doing the right thing or they're doing the wrong thing. There's no subtlety to anyone's actions apart from... Well, Snape is the prime example. Everything Snape does, Harry goes, 
that's sneaky. That's bullshit. He's going to try and kill someone. <laughs> right. And every single time leading up to that, he's literally been protecting people. However, he has done some shitty things in the classroom. Yes. <laughs> we have a very, very, very skewed perception of Snape because we only see him through Harry's eyes. But he's thinking through all of this and is interrupted by Cormac McLaggen. Ray. <laughs> who honestly, I think is more annoying than Lavender. I'm going to go ahead and just say I'm on that side because Harry does later say that he's not sure who bothers him more. He's being dogged by Cormac and Lavender and he's not sure which one he's more annoyed by. I think it's Cormac because he's literally sitting up waiting for Harry to come back from the hospital wing because he saw them take Ron there. And his first thought is, well, Ron's not going to be fit. Looks like I'm keeper. And Harry can't think of a good reason for him not to be because he was the second best, possibly the best, <laughs> Hermione's shenanigans at aside, the best. <laughs> at the trials. Yeah, equally the best. He's He's good enough. So he's just like, oh, yeah, I guess you will. And he's like, great, when's the next practice? And Harry's just like, it'll be tomorrow. He's like, okay, uh, we need to get together and talk some strategies beforehand. And Harry's just like, yeah, but not tonight. I'm tired. And then he just like actually goes to bed. And then the next day is when the news of Ron's poisoning spreads pretty quickly. But surprisingly harry doesn't have to answer a lot of questions about it because they're really not as concerned like with katie bell's accident attempted murder whatever you want to call it it was scarier it was clearly an attempt on someone's life they didn't know she wasn't the recipient so they thought it was an attempt on hers and she's still not back so that was more cause for concern than Ron accidentally getting poisoned, but immediately getting the antidote. And they're just like, ah, he'll be fine. Whatever. Quidditch! And they have that upcoming match against Hufflepuff, Gryffindor against Hufflepuff. And all of the Gryffindors especially are waiting for this match because Zachariah Smith is on the Hufflepuff team and they fucking hate him, especially after his bullshit commentary from their previous game. So they're like, it is retribution time. We're going to take him down. And that's their main focus. And then you have Harry, who normally is equally obsessed about Quidditch, but he's losing that focus because all he can think about is meddling with Malfoy. He's just constantly checking his Marauder's map, trying to figure out where he is, what he's doing, where he's going, why he's disappearing off the map, but doesn't have any real time to figure anything out. So it's just something that's taking up headspace. And preventing him from doing the other things he's supposed to be doing as well as he should be doing them. Some of which also includes getting that damn memory from Slughorn. Which does take a little bit of a backseat at this point. And obviously he's yeah. getting a bit more interested with Draco now because he knew that Draco... Well, he, he thinks he knows that Draco is behind katie bell's accident so he's starting to like let the cogs turn on the fact that maybe draco's involved with ron's as well and so that's now at the forefront of his mind and that makes sense yeah and i do get that oh something that i wanted to mention that i forgot to is when the adults leave the hospital wing in the movie yeah slughorn stays behind for a moment and just watches and I actually, when I was doing the summary, thought that was really effective because it really starts to show that side of Slughorn where he's starting to see why Dumbledore might need that memory. He's starting to understand how serious this is getting. And you could see it in his face. He never says anything. He just stands there kind of like, oh, shit, this is getting bad. I'm not going to be able to stay Switzerland for much longer. But he's still not ready to just give it up to Harry. So, yeah, it does kind of take a back seat in both the book and the movie at this point. But it was really interesting the way that they decided to include that. I didn't mind that addition. Yeah. So, like I was saying, Harry is brain everywhere but the things it's supposed to be on. And by everywhere, I mean solely on Nazi von Douchebag the second, And on top of his homework and Quidditch practice 
like I mentioned before, he's getting constantly dogged by Cormac and Lavender. Cormac, who just wants to discuss Quidditch strategies and keeps making hints that he would make a better permanent keeper. And I'm just, ew, like, did you not watch that previous match where Ron fucking killed it? Like, you are so far untested, and you are only here because he's been fucking poisoned, and you're already trying to replace him. I just don't like him. I think he's creepy. He's an absolute creep. He is the worst thing in the film by far. <laughs> yeah. And then Lavender just keeps trying to talk about Ron's feelings with Harry. Like, did he notice my hair? Did he say anything about my dress robes? Did he, did he, does he, will he, should we... What can? And Harry's just like, why don't you talk to Ron about all of this? And then Lavender's just like, well, I would. But every time I go to the hospital wing, he's asleep. <laughs> like you had mentioned. He just full on fucking pretends to be asleep every time his girlfriend shows up to visit him in the hospital wing after he was poisoned. Like, dude, that relationship's over. Grow a pair. Be awake. And just be like, you know, this near-death experience has really showed me the important things. And I just don't think we have what it takes to be a long-term relationship. Been great snogging ya. Go find some other lips. Uh, I should be hired to break up with people for people. I'd be so good at it. <laughs> I mean, again, like, they're both really young. <laughs> True. And I feel like this must be... Oh, I don't even know. What do you think? Do you think this is Lavender's, like, first relationship? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that. It's definitely Ron's. It's definitely Ron's. <laughs> Communication is not super strong amongst most teenagers. No. And their relationship starts with her snogging him. Right. It's not going to end well. <laughs> no. And it doesn't, but it's not yet over in the book. The movie pretty much cut it off at this point. In the book, Ron is still extremely avoiding actually having a real conversation ending it. But to be fair, he probably doesn't talk to her much. As he said, it's mostly snogging. He probably doesn't even know how to start a conversation with her. He probably doesn't even have the time to come up for air. Can't remember her name. To break up with Can't. her. <laughs> <laughs> It's the only conversation they've ever had has been kissing, and he's just going, I would break up with her, but I do not know what her name is. <laughs> right? <laughs> he should just accidentally call her Hermione or something. Yeah. And this leads on to Lavender getting angry about Hermione again. Yeah, which is the closest that it comes to that similarity. Like, this is, this is one of those essence things where Lavender demands to Harry to know if Hermione's still visiting Ron. And Harry's just like, well, yeah, they're friends. And she's just like, friends, don't make me laugh. She didn't speak to him for weeks after we started going out. And it is the essence of that that we got in the movie. It was just direct between Lavender and Hermione at that point. And then shut down immediately by the unconscious Ron. But... It's Harry fielding it by himself and feeling very uncomfortable about it. And when Lavender makes the same comment about Hermione wanting to be friends with Ron now that he's gotten all interesting, it's Harry who's just like, would you call getting poisoned being interesting? And unfortunately, he does not call her a daft dimbo or a bimbo. He just goes, really? Uh, there's Cormac, gotta go. He needs to talk about Quidditch stuff. And then in reality, he just avoids both of them. I love the fact that it specifically says he dashes through a door that's pretending to be a solid wall and then makes his way up the corridor, like sprinting to get to potions because Cormac and Lavender cannot follow him there. And that's where I cut off the book chapter. It shows that Harry really crumbles without his normal friendship group there and he just doesn't really know how to interact with these people who he doesn't like anyway and it, it completely throws him and he has to think of these very intense ways to leave situations so i'm just gonna run i'm just gonna leave yep. <laughs> bye and i can't blame him because when you have to hide that much of who you are and what you're dealing with from the rest of the world 
it would be really uncomfortable to have to interact with the rest of the world but at least with his friends who know what's going on he can be more relaxed in himself so i get it but there's gotta be a part of him that just has to be like dude i don't give a fuck about your quidditch strategies i'm probably gonna die within the next few years or so so shut up <laughs> and then with lavender like Ron doesn't like you. He's snogging you because he's never snogged anybody before. He's so over this. You should just break up with him before he breaks up with you. <laughs> that would be the good the good thing to do. <laughs> I don't know how Ron would actually feel about that, though. Not well. <laughs> <laughs> there really weren't any new characters to talk about since we've really talked about all of them at this point. Like I said, I do love Jesse Cave's performance as Lavender in that scene, but I've been saying that about every scene that she has because she's just delightfully crazy and just really pulls off that character very well. Do you see her on like social media and stuff now? And she is just one of the coolest people in the world. <laughs> she is unique. She's kind of like a real world Luna, I feel like. Lavanna Lynch is doing loads of really cool stuff, but she isn't Luna in real life. But Jessie Caves is, is incredible and exactly like Luna. Her outfits alone. Her outfits. <laughs> I believe that Carly and Abigail were both saying that they think she might be a little crazy for real, like Lavender was. But I don't know. I just, I think she's unique. I think she is an interesting person. I do follow her on Instagram. So. But I think that we can just move on to our Potter Pondering. Excellent. So this week's Potter Pondering. Do you think it really was lucky for the Weasleys that Ron sat in Harry's compartment on the Hogwarts Express? Or did Ron sitting with Harry bring about more danger? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. Don't forget, you can also stitch your response on TikTok. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. That'll bring us to our wizarding word, which is WZRD presents a whimsical musical night of fun with Dream Quaffle, How Airplanes Fly, Hawthorne and Holly, and the blibbering Humdingers. It takes place at the Conduit in Winter Park, Florida on Saturday, November 2nd, 2024. If I'm not mistaken, this isn't far from Orlando. So you could make a trip to Orlando and you could go to Harry Potter World and Universal Studios and you could catch these awesome wizarding based bands. The tickets are only $20. It seems like a really cool event. I know there are a lot of Harry Potter fans in Florida, so I just wanted to make sure to spread the word. We'll post links on our Facebook that have links to the band sites as well as a link to get the tickets. If you are interested in this is something that you could make happen, be it a trip to Florida or you're already there. That does sound really fun. But yeah, so you can find that information up on Facebook and check it out if nothing else you can find their links to videos and whatnot so you can just watch their music if you can't make it there for themselves they're really fun all of the groups fantastic well that'll take us to this week's trivia question which is what was the final score for the quidditch match when gryffindor lost to hufflepuff the first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag losers luggy will get a sticker Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us, either through Apple or whatever podcast platform you listen on or on our Facebook page. Make sure to email us at foxsakepod at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at Fox Sake Pod will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. 
Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where, in addition to our weekly podcast episodes, we post some other random videos like blooper reels, vlogs, our old cooking show episodes, hopefully new ones if we manage to make some. We do have a patron program. You can find us on Patreon at Pod. Patronage starts at $2 and will get you some awesome perks like for Fox Sake swag, access to our Discord channel, chats, and more. Check out our page for the details. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next time when we talk about the second half of Chapter 19, Elf Tales, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Max. I'm Ellen. And we are For Fox Sake. Sake.